I'm Gerald Reyes. Ten years ago, I found great pleasure in doing bad businesses to make more money, to get ahead of my peers and to fulfill my selfish desires. Eventually, bad businesses turned into bad relationships. Apart from the illegal business, I also entered into an illicit affair. This resulted to my separation from my family. I felt so powerful and my ego was fully gratified. However, I also grew farther away from my family. My life was so miserable and my daughters hated me. Every time I, I visited them, they wanted to throw me out of the house. I thought I was happy living with another family and doing my illegal deals, but I wasn't. Deep inside, there was so much emptiness and guilt in my heart. My name is Naiji Reyes. Growing up, I thought I had everything a young girl wanted. A nice home, a good education, and parents who loved me. However, when I was in high school, my seemingly perfect world was crushed when I found out that my dad was having an affair and that my parents were separating. Being the firstborn, it took a huge blow on me emotionally as my mom and sisters confided in me. My heart was full of anger against my dad and even against God. I even swore to God that I would live life on my own terms. I began to rebel, going out and partying with friends every weekend and even having a boyfriend that my parents didn't approve of. Eventually, a friend of ours who went to CCF Alabang endorsed my wife and I for marriage counseling. I missed most of the sessions and never took it seriously. After a few months, my business eventually went bankrupt and my affair went sour. I also got sick and found myself going back to my family. My daughters resisted my presence and hated my wife for, for, for giving me another chance. I was in so much pain and confusion. The gospel was also shared to me a couple of times, but I resisted. However, as we continued to be counseled, I began to understand and eventually receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I realized how much I was sinning and turn to God for forgiveness. It was a great moment of peace and comfort. I couldn't accept how my mom could welcome my dad back into our lives. However, after they started to attend counseling sessions, I saw a gradual change. They got into less fights and started to talk about God at home. One day, they brought my sisters and I to one Sunday service and even placed us in a D group. There, I heard the gospel for the first time, how Jesus Christ died on the cross to save a sinner like me, and how he loved me despite how much I've hurt him with my rebellion. I was hesitant, but it made me long for more than what I settled for. And after a couple more D-group meetings, I finally surrendered my life to Jesus. But though I was reconciled with my Heavenly Father, it took a while before I was truly reconciled with my earthly dad. Though we were civil, there was still tension whenever the past issues were brought up. When my parents started to attend D-group and GLC classes, I saw their eagerness to learn about God and how they strive to obey Him, even when it was hard or uncomfortable. I also began to enjoy attending these Bible studies and met friends there who invited me to join Elevate. But what really brought my dad and I together was joining the worship ministry. Volunteering in ministry, my dad and I spent a lot of time together. We would practice in the car whenever he took me to and from school, and my dad would even encourage me to memorize scripture during our car rides. It wasn't always fun, and we would still argue at times. But it was a way for us to talk about what happened in the past, say our apologies, and move on. My dad really went the extra mile, not only in helping me love the Word of God, but even in getting to know me as a person, asking about my day, even buying me snacks, and praying for my concerns. It was truly a time of healing for us as father and daughter, as we served and grew together in Christ. Slowly, I regained her trust and respect. By the grace of God, my whole family has now reconciled. My wife and I, together with my daughters, are all serving as small group leaders. My daughters also became actively involved in Elevate. God is truly faithful. He did not allow my family to separate, and He paved the way for all of us to be saved. Praise God indeed. By the time... <laughs> praise God. By the time Naiji graduated from college, he felt a call to serve God as full-time campus missionary in Elevate. Initially, my wife and I refused, thinking that she would be better off financially in a corporate environment. Though she obeyed, after 10 months of working, her calling to serve in campus ministry became stronger, and I saw how joyfully she served the Lord in Elevate. 
she would confide in me how much she wanted to obey God's calling in her life. And eventually, my wife and I began to pray hard to God for wisdom. We realized that though Naiji is our daughter, she's first God's, and we have to trust that He will take care of her wherever she wants to serve. We allowed her to apply as full-time campus missionary, and God continues to be faithful to her until today. In her four years of full-time work, I saw how God provided for her every need. God truly takes care of us and our children in ways we could never ask or imagine. He is indeed our provider, restorer, and savior. I am Gerald Reyes. And I am Naiji Reyes. To, to God, God be, be all, all the, glory. the glory. The message last week was, know God's will and do it. And, and, th and this week, I want to challenge all of us that if you really want to know God's will, if you really want to make a difference, and how many of you, by the way, want to make a difference while you're alive? Because life is short. My aunt was diagnosed in August of, of 2018, stage one cancer, and then it was so fast, she died on the, the week before June 12. She died on a Saturday, and it was just so fast. And it reminds me, we're so fragile, and so it's really important what we do with our life while we are alive. And that's what excites me about today's message. We have one main idea for today's message, and I want you to, to read it with me. Can you read it with me? Study, apply, and teach the Bible. Say it again. Study, apply, and teach the Bible. What is the Bible? This is the Bible, and somebody once told me the Bible is basic instruction before leaving earth. B-I-B-L-E, basic instruction before leaving earth. And this prepares you to really fulfill the purposes that God has for you. If you want your life to really count, if I want my life to really count, then I encourage all of us to study, apply, and teach the Bible. And why do I say that? I've looked at the men and women that have made the most impact in my life. I think of my dad and my very clear, vivid image of him as a kid growing up was seeing my dad on his study table with, with the Bible. And he, he studied it every day, and he still does. I think of guys like Dr. Ravi Zacharias, right? The impact he's had in, in so, many, so many people's lives and getting to spend some time with him. He really studies the Bible, and he applies it and he teaches it. Guys like Edmund Chan, your D group leaders, they're making an impact in your life. All of us are called to study, apply, and teach the Bible. And so I wanna encourage you, as we look at the Apostle Paul, who in my opinion, was a great example of somebody who studied scripture, who applied it, and who taught it, that you would be encouraged to do the same after our time together today. The Apostle Paul picked up Timothy in Acts chapter 16. You remember? In Lystra. Timothy was the son of a Jewish woman and a Greek father. And Paul discipled him. So this is a letter from Paul to Timothy. Telling Timothy what he should keep on doing. He said in 2 Timothy 3.14, You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them. So keep keep studying, keep growing, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. I believe Timothy's mother taught him the Old Testament scripture. And Paul says, keep studying. This is where you find salvation, in Christ Jesus. And the next verse, which is very famous verse, which I'm sure you know. Let's read it together. All scripture is inspired by God, and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correcting, for training in righteousness. You study scripture, you study the Bible, not just for information, but for, for what? Transformation. And that's what scripture does. It's powerful. It says it's, it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man and the woman of God may be, a, may be adequate, equipped, for every good work. And so what's the message today? Study, apply, and teach the Bible. 
And we see that in the book of Acts. So we continue in this amazing series we're in of the book of Acts. And Paul was just in Philippi, remember? Last week, he was in Philippi, he got beaten up, he was in jail, there was an earthquake, he was let go, and then now he's traveling to another place. And let's see, let's pick it up from, from where we left off. Verse 1, now when they had traveled through Amphipolis and Apollina, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. So if you are a visual person like me, I want to know what's happening. He was in Philippi. And then after that, after getting beaten up, being put in prison, and being let loose, let, being set free, he traveled to Amphipolis, which is about 33 miles from Philippi, stayed the night there. He didn't, he didn't spend the day there, just there to rest, and then traveled again to Apollina, about another 30 miles. Again, same thing, stayed there the night, and then continued on to Thessalonica, which is about, again, another 30 plus miles. And what was so strategic about Thessalonica? Well, it's a port city. It's the capital of Macedonia. A lot of trade and commerce was there. People pride themselves of being free. And it was a very progressive, it was a, it was, it was a huge city at the time. And Paul and, and Silas were strategic in going to that place. Now, what do we know about Paul and Silas? When there's a synagogue, and there was a synagogue here, what do they normally do? They go to the synagogue first. Now remember, what happens to Paul when he goes to the synagogue? After he, he teaches and explains who Jesus is, what happens? He gets beaten up, right? The people in the synagogue don't like what he's saying. They react. So I would think, what made this guy so courageous? How come even after going to so many synagogues and getting beaten up, the first place he goes to, whenever he visits a new city is the synagogue. And I'm convinced a person who studies, who applies, and who teaches the Bible becomes a man and, or a woman of courage because you experience God. And courage is simply trusting God, that he will do what he says. And Paul, he said he was called to do what he was doing. So we see that. So in verse 2, according to Paul's custom, he went then he went to them, he went to the Jews in the synagogue, and for three Sabbaths reasoned. The Greek word for reason is dialegomai, with them from the scriptures. Now that's an interesting word. Because what I'm doing to you right now is not reasoning with you. I'm, I'm preaching to you. But that Greek word means it's a dialogue. It's almost like I would speak and then you'd speak and you'd ask a question and I would answer. And that's what Paul was doing. He was defending the faith. He was explaining to people from where? From the scriptures. He was using the scriptures. The apostle Peter tells us that we should be ready to give an account of the hope that we believe in. Are you ready to be able to talk to your friends about who Jesus is? One of the reasons why I want to encourage us to study scripture so that we can be ready. We can, we can have a dialogue with our friends. We can have dialogue with all kinds of people. The Apostle Paul was able to do it publicly. Study scripture. He also tells us, be ready in season and out of season to, to talk about who Jesus is. And how was he dialoguing with them? It tells us here. He was explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead. What was he using? What was he using to give evidence? He was using scripture, it tells us. And scripture is the Old Testament. So I can imagine that Paul went to the book of Isaiah. And in, in Isaiah, he was giving evidence, he was explaining, he was laying, laying it on the table, trying to explain to them that the Christ had to suffer and rise again. And there's a verse in Isaiah, chapter 53, verse 5. This is what it says. But he was pierced through our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging, we are healed. The book of Isaiah was written 700 years before Christ was born. And Paul was using the Old Testament to show the people who believed in God, 
The people in the synagogue were composed of Jews and Gentiles worshiping God. And Paul was saying that, look, the scripture, I'm giving you evidence that there is a man, a Messiah, and he was called to suffer and rise again. He would also, I'm sure he turned to Psalms chapter 16, the same Psalm that the apostle Peter preached after Pentecost, where he said that you will not allow the Holy One to undergo decay, speaking of Jesus rising again from the dead, and so on and so on. He was, he was laying down his case why in the scripture it was prophesied that there would be a Messiah. And then he shifts gears from talking about scripture, he now talks about history. Look what he says, and saying, and saying, what was he saying? This Jesus, so he started talking about Jesus, how Jesus was born in Bethlehem, how Jesus lived he lived a regular life here on earth. But then when he became 30, you know, he began his, his, his ministry. All the way to the point that he was crucified. All the point that he was buried and then rose again. And Paul was using first-hand experience because he saw the risen Christ. He said, this Jesus whom I pro I'm proclaiming. So he was telling people who this Jesus is. He's a historical person who lived on this earth. Who I'm proclaiming to you is who? The Christ. You see what Paul was doing? Paul knew the scripture. He knew the Old Testament scripture that he could reason with the people in Thessalonica for three straight Sabbaths and explain to them who Jesus Christ is. That there is only forgiveness on the shed blood of Jesus Christ on Calvary. And he went back to the Old Testament to show that. Now what happened? Some of them... It says, some of them were persuaded. Have you ever had to persuade somebody? What do you do when you persuade somebody? If you're in sales, how do you sell your product? You talk about your product, right? You talk about everything that's good about the product and good salespeople always tell the truth, right? Because they will, they will share, share what the product is and then the buyer ends up having to decide, am I going to buy this? Is it worth what I'm going to buy? They, people in sales know how to persuade. Now, the Apostle Paul, he was talking to a group and he was trying to persuade them of what? He was trying to convince them that Jesus really is the Messiah. Last weekend, my wife and I were in Tacloban. We were in Tacloban because we wanted to go to Ormoc. So Ormoc is about two hours from Tacloban. And we were asked to go to Ormoc because there is a group of coaches who attended a training for sports ministry and they caught the vision. They said, this is a great tool to connect with the young people through sport and then to relate the sport to life and then relate life to God. A great way to connect somebody who doesn't, who would never go to church, but we could connect with them through sport and then connect them to God. And so they said, hey, can you guys come down and train us? So we met, we met some D groups in Tacloban, praise God. Your brothers and sisters there are, are worshiping God. There's D groups also in Ormoc. And we trained them. Now part of the training was at the end of the training, we had to do a practical application of the training. And our practical application was to run a basketball clinic. So we did a basketball clinic for 18 year olds and below. And we used an amazing, a nice facility. It was a covered court. And the person who let us use it was the barangay counselor. So I was introduced to him. I met him. He's a cool-looking guy. You know, had like long hair and tattoos all over himself. He's a cool-looking dude. And we, we chatted. I was thanking him for letting us use the place. Now, as the clinic began, I was getting ready to help train the kids how to shoot, how to dribble. But I really felt a tug in my heart to talk to the barangay counselor instead of doing it with the kids because they had other coaches. So I sat down, you know, when you feel a tug in your heart most of the time and it's to, to talk to somebody about God, who do you think is tugging at your heart? It's the Holy Spirit, right? Satan's not going to tug at your heart and tell you to, to share the gospel to somebody. He tugs at your heart to do other things. He tempts you at times. But when it's to share the gospel, you know it's God. So I obeyed. I sat down beside him and I started talking to him. And we somehow we got to the topic of the assurance of, of, of life. Like what happens after this life? And is he sure? And he said he wasn't sure. 
So I said, do you want to be sure? And he said, yes. And so I began with Genesis. I said, you know, God created us in his image to have a relationship with him. That's how God designed us. But because of sin, sin entered the world through Adam and Eve, and that broke the relationship we had with God, the, the design that God had for us. And that's why we have all this right now. We have part of the problems we're facing is because of the sin in this world. But I said, but the rest of the Bible, God's word, talks about how God would redeem us to himself. So I took him through some little Bible history about Israel and about the sacrifices they had to do. And I said, all of that doesn't really make sense until you go to the New Testament where you see Jesus. And Jesus was actually prophesied about from, from Scripture, from the Old Testament, that there would be a Messiah. And John the Baptist was prophesied about, that there would be a forerunner. And I said, John the Baptist, he came, and when he saw Jesus, he said, that's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And I explained to him that all the sacrifices happening in the Old Testament were pointing to what Jesus would do. Because our problem is sin. And sin separates us from God. And that's why no matter what we do, we will never be able to, to go to heaven on our own because of sin. We need our sin to be paid for. And I explained the gospel that Jesus paid for it all. And after I shared with him, I said, do you want to believe in Jesus? I was trying to persuade him. I was trying to convince him. He looked at me and he said, right now? I said, yes, right now. And then he, he asked me, he said, oh, by the way, are, are you, um, what, what are you? Are you a Methodist? I, I said, he said, he started saying, my wife's a Methodist. I'm like, well, what am I? That's a good question. I'm a Bible-believing follower of Jesus. And then I explained to him again. And I said, so do you want to, be, to believe in Jesus? He said, yes, I do, but not here. He said, let's do it over there. And he took me to his barangay hall, and we sat down, and together we prayed to trust in Jesus Christ. And he gave his life to Christ. Praise God. And I share that with you because God is calling all of us to be his witness wherever we go. But how can we effectively witness about God if we don't take time to study his word? What's the message today? Study, apply, and teach the Bible. So we keep, we continue on. In verse 5, what happened? Some believed, it says here, right? Some believed along with a large number of God-fearing Greeks. So these were Gentiles and a number of leading women. It's very important because you'll see what happened to Thessalonica as we, as we wrap up at the end later on. But they believed. But as they believed, whenever you do God's work, what happens? You can expect persecution. You can expect conflict. You can expect problems. Look what happened. The Jews becoming jealous for whatever reason. A lot of Jews were jealous because they wanted salvation only for themselves. They said, we are the people of God. Why is, why is the Gentiles now given the privilege to believe in God? They didn't like that. They were jealous and taking along some wicked men from the marketplace. I realize when you're jealous, you will do a lot of crazy things. They took wicked men from the marketplace, formed the mob, and set the city in an uproar. And attacking the house of Jason, they were seeking to bring them out to the people. Who was Jason? Why were they attacking the house of Jason? Well, we find out that Jason was the one who hosted Paul and Silas. But when they went to Jason's house, Paul and Silas weren't there. So what happened? When they did not find them, they began dragging Jason and some brethren before the city authorities, shouting. Can you read it with me? What were they shouting? These men who have upset the world have come here also. Is this a compliment? Isn't it amazing how in three weeks' time, they would say that these men have upset the world? And the Greek word for world here is referring to the Roman Empire. They were so effective at what they were doing, they, they were noticed. They created something. You know, when you study Scripture and you apply it and you teach it, God will use you to turn things right side up. Not to turn things upside down, but to turn things right side up. There's power 
when you do what God wants you to do. And that's what happened. And that's what they were reacting. And what did they say? They said, and Jason, verse 7, has welcomed them. And they all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. So they understood part of the message that, yes, Jesus really is the king of this kingdom that we all serve together. But they took it out of context also, and they, they, they added revolutionary tones to it and said, look, this is, this is dangerous. So they got Jason, and what happened? They stirred up the crowd and the city authorities who had heard these things. And when they had received a pledge from Jason and the others, they released them. What happened? What's the pledge? So the picture is they got Jason and his friends, other believers in Christ. They held them, but they eventually released them when they, when they gave a pledge. The pledge was like a bail, like a bail with a promise. And the promise was Paul and Silas will not come back to this place. We will not let Paul come back here. They were so upset at Paul. How do we know that? If you look at 1 Thessalonians, this is Paul writing now to the, to the Thessalonians. This is what he said in 1 Thessalonians 2.17, but we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short while, in person, not in spirit, were all the more eager with great desire to see your face, for we wanted to come to you. I, Paul, more than once, and yet, what? Satan hindered us. Commentaries would say that they believe Satan hindered them through that pledge because Jason made a promise. He was, he was set free for that promise, but they had to keep to that promise. But Paul was able to send Timothy, and you will see what happened to the church in Thessalonica as we wrap up. But that was the situation. Friends, when you do what God wants you to do, you can expect opposition. You can expect discouragement. But God's word and applying it and his spirit will give you the courage. Why was Paul so courageous? Why was he so, had so much conviction? Why, why did he have so much con commitment? because of God in his life, the Spirit and God's Word. And you and I will have the same if we study, if we apply, if we teach God's Word. What happened? The brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night. So they knew it was trouble. And they made that pledge. They had to get Paul and, and, the, and Silas out. And where did they go? To Berea. And when they arrived, where did they go? First place, where did they go? <laughs> they went into the synagogue of the Jews. I would think, man, you know, you know those experiments where if you touch something and there's electric current, eventually you learn not to touch it, right? If you, if you want to train an animal, you put some current and then every time they touch it, they get zapped. They learn not to touch it, right? Not Paul. It's like every time he went to the synagogue, he would get it. But he was so courageous because of God's word. He was so courageous that he went. What's Romans chapter 1, verse 8? I am not ashamed of the gospel, right? For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, also to the Gentile. So Paul was committed to go to the synagogue to teach who Jesus really is. And that's what he did. Now, what did he find in Berea? It's like a parallel story to the first part. But what happened in Berea? Now these, the Bereans, were more what? Noble-minded. When you think of noble, nobility, what do you think of? King, queen, prince, people of, of high character, right? So they're saying these Bereans were, were more noble-minded. They, they had elevated character than those in Thessalonica. So they make the comparison. Like these guys were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica. Why? Can you read it with me? For they... Receive the word with great eagerness. Eagerness. What makes you eager? When was the last time that you were excited about something? I have something here. These are my props. But they're not props because these are real letters. So these are letter, this is emails from Paul Tanchi. And this one is emails from Jenny. So Jenny, in a, in a season in our life, we had a long-distance relationship, right? So... It was maybe eight, nine months that she was in the States and I was here. And friends, do you think I was eager every time I would receive an email from Jenny? 
Oh, I would look for that email every day. Ah, oh, no email. Ah. Oh. Next day, ah, oh, no email. And then when the email would come, I would get it, and I would, I would go through that letter. I would read it, read it again. What's she saying? What does she mean? Is there any truth? Well, you know, what, what is this? I was so eager. Why was I eager? Because I really, really liked Jenny. We weren't husband and wife yet, but I was hoping that she would one day be my wife. And there was an eagerness there. Can I be honest with you? This book has not always been exciting to me. Yeah, I grew up in a Christian home, but there were times that this book was boring. The Bible for me would make me sleep. It wasn't something that I looked forward to read. But somewhere along my journey with Christ, it changed. God says this is his love letter to you. This is his love letter to me. And when you see everything that Jesus has done for you, and you know that what God wants from you is, is good, he wants what's best for you, then it changes the perspective to this entire book. And I praise God for this, for the Bible. There's an eagerness. Maybe some of us don't have an eagerness because we don't understand also the heart of God. The psalmist did. Look at what the psalmist said. The psalmist said, how blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But, what? His delight is in the law, in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. How many of you have been blessed by the scripture memory challenge that we're trying to do here every week? You're, you're actually trying to memorize the scripture. Can you raise your hands? Well, I praise God for you. I think this group is more spiritual than the 9 o'clock group. But you see, it's only a few of you guys raise your hands. Can I tell you, as you memorize scripture, as you meditate on God's word day and night, that's how you memorize it, and you are careful about the order of words because you want to say it as it's written, it does something to you. You understand God's word in a different way. It's different than just reading it. And the psalmist knew that. He said, how blessed is the man who meditates on God's scripture day and night. And he gives a description. And I love this description. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. And whatever he does, he prospers. Isn't that beautiful? How many of you have water shortage in your house? Great. So do I. So we're on the same boat. But the Christian life, friends, isn't always rainy season. There are times that there's going to be a drought. And there's problems that come. The psalmist knew the secret. He said, you want a firm foundation? You want your roots to be deep so that even though there's no rain, your leaf doesn't wither, you're still bearing fruit? What's the secret? Meditate on God's scripture day and night. God called us to bear fruit, not just fruit. He said, I want you to bear much fruit. And you know that through John chapter 15, right? He says, if you abide in me and I abide in you, you will bear fruit. The secret to bearing fruit is, is God. And that's why, what's the message today? Study, apply, and teach the Bible. Another verse. Look at John chapter, uh, Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. He says, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night. Why? So you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. What's that called? Application. The Bible isn't for information. It's for transformation. And it transforms you when you obey it, when you apply it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have success. A lot of the reasons why we experience trouble in our own life is because it's self-inflicted. We didn't follow biblical principles. And God tells us how to experience true blessing, right? I'm not talking about financial blessing. I'm not saying that you meditate on Scripture and you're going to have like a million pesos in your bank account. No, but I'm saying you meditate on Scripture, you do what God tells you to do, and you will be like a tree. 
that's firmly planted, that no matter what happens to you, whatever troubles come, you will stand the test of that trial because you are deeply grounded in God. So they were more noble-minded because they received the word with great eagerness. They were excited. Not only that, examining, that's the Greek word anakrino, which means to look at things from a judicial perspective. It's to have integrity and no bias. You're looking at it without any bias. They examined the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. I praise God for the Bereans because when the Apostle Paul came to them and started telling them about Jesus, I'm sure some of them were like, wait, is this true? But they didn't criticize him immediately. They had an open mind. I found one of the dangers as I grow older as a Christian is sometimes I can have a preconceived notion of how things should be, of, of, of how how a certain speaker should say certain things. And if I don't like what the speaker is saying, then I can find myself turn off and then just throw out everything else he says. And that's dangerous. The Bereans, they were objective, unbiased, but they were faithful to go back to Scripture and to examine. They were critical at the same time as being biased. They wanted to make sure, is what Paul is saying really in the Bible? Is, that, is this Jesus really the Messiah? And I believe that's the attitude you and I should have. Whenever somebody preaches here, or somebody teaches in your D group, or you watch a video on the internet, you have an open mind. Listen to what they're saying. But then you go back and you, and you critique it. You critique it based on Scripture. Is this, what, is this what God is saying? Or is this something that that person is just saying? And be careful. Don't come in with bias because you can miss out on, on truth that God is speaking on. You know, the Pharisees, did they, know, did they study Scripture? Did they? Well, they memorized the first five books of the Bible. They supposedly knew Scripture, but did they miss out on who Jesus is? They missed out. They, they, they couldn't see it was, it was Jesus. How about the disciples of Jesus? Do you remember when Jesus, as he came closer and closer to his death, was telling the disciples that the Son of Man has to go to Jerusalem. He must suffer and he must die. He was telling them that. What did Peter say? Oh, no, 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 Lord. No, no, no. What did God tell Peter? Get behind me, Satan. So even the disciples, they, they couldn't make that connection. Even after Jesus had died and risen from the dead, remember the, the disciples walking to Emmaus and they were chatting? Jesus actually started walking with them and they were chatting. And they didn't understand everything until Jesus, Jesus said, oh, you fools, do I have to open your minds to what is written in Scripture and in the prophets? And that's when they, they saw. So we need to be like the Bereans. Examine Scripture. How often? How often? Daily. Daily. And what happened? As they examined Scripture, Many of them believed. Remember in Thessalonica, what did Paul have to do? Persuade them. He tried to convince them. But in this case, because the Bereans had studied Scripture and they saw it for themselves, on their own accord, they what? They believed. I genuinely believe that if you are a man or a woman who is genuinely seeking who God is and you go into the Scripture, you will see for yourself and you will believe. But you need to take the time to investigate it. And not just what that person said or that person said. You go and you study for yourself. And like the Bereans, they believed. Many of them, not all, but many, along with a number of prominent Greek women and men. Now what happened? After you do God's work, what can you expect? Persecution and trials. And so the Jews of Thessalonica, so they followed them found out that the word of God had been proclaimed by Paul in Berea also, they came there as well, agitating and stirring up the crowds. Then immediately the brethren sent Paul out to go as far as the sea, and Silas and Timothy remained there. Now th those who escorted Paul brought him as far as Athens, and receiving a command 
for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they left. What happened? The troublemakers from Thessalonica came to Berea and Paul left. Where did he go? Again, the map. He went from Berea. He traveled all the way down to Athens, about 300 miles by sea. Now, you don't want to miss what happens in Athens. I'm not going to talk about it today. It's next week. So you have to come back, okay? And next week, you're going to learn what happened in Athens. It's amazing. But today, what's the message, if we can summarize it? Study, apply, and teach Scripture. How, how should we teach? Well, Paul gives us an insight to how he taught in those three, three weeks that he was there every Sabbath. Look at what he said. In 1 Thessalonians, this is now Paul. He's writing to the church in Thessalonica. He says, for our gospel did not come to you in word only. When you teach, you're not teaching just the knowledge you know. It wasn't just in word. But what was the secret? What made it so powerful? But also in power and in the Holy Spirit. Whenever you teach God's word, cover it with prayer. You pray before you teach, before you speak, before you talk to somebody, you pray. Because it is the power of God that saves people. It is His Holy Spirit that opens eyes, that opens up hearts. And that's what they experience in Thessalonica, God's power. And not just, not just teaching the Word, but look, with full conviction. Paul, Paul was so convinced about who Jesus was. Why? Because he saw Jesus rise again from the dead. He saw Him alive. You remember the story of, of Lazarus, the rich man Lazarus, and how he went to hell and the poor man was uh, in, in heaven? And, the, and he was saying, the rich man was like, hey, can you send back Lazarus from the dead so that my brothers will believe? And what did, what did Jesus say in the, in the story? They said, if they didn't believe the prophets and the scripture, even if Moses were to come back from the dead, they wouldn't believe. And it's true. Jesus had come back from the dead, and yet they didn't believe him. It is only God that enables people like you and me to believe in him. It's his grace. But we have a part to play. We need to know the scripture. We need to be able to teach it and apply it. Because many times it's our own lives that disqualify us. But Paul, his life was consistent. And we see that in the letter to, to, the, to, the, to the Thessalonians. Look at this, just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. So they were, it's one thing to teach God's word, but we need to apply God's word so that it has power in your life. What's the message today? Study, apply, and teach God's word. What's the danger? This is the warning. Paul warns us, 1 Corinthians 8.1, now concerning things sacrificed to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. What is he saying? He's saying we know that idols aren't, aren't, they aren't gods anyways. They're not the God. So even if food is sacrificed to them, we can eat it. But look at what he says. Knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. As you study scripture, as you grow deeper and deeper in your relationship with God, two things should happen to you and me. Number one, we should become more and more humble. If you're becoming more and more proud with what you're learning, you know you're, it's the wrong kind of studying. We need to become more and more humble. And what's the second thing? We need to become more and more loving. The danger is sometimes you, you go deeper and deeper and, you, and, you, and then you start feeling that, oh, this is the only way. We become more and more legalistic. But as you grow deeper and deeper in your study of God and your relationship with Him, the more loving and outward we should become. I'm not saying you're going to compromise on the essential things, no. But the non-essential stuff, we can have unity even though you worship differently from the way I worship. Some people like to worship and they, they speak tongues. I, I've never done it. I'm not going to be, have an issue over that. The more deeper we grow in our study with God, the more humble we should become and the more loving we should become of one another. 
Because that's, that's what Christ's about. He says, by your love for one another, that's how the world will know if you are my disciples. And that's what happens when you apply God's word. If you don't apply God's word, then it is a real danger. Knowledge puffs up. Be careful. Now, what happened to Thessalonica? What happened to Berea? Two different places. The Bereans, they were more noble, right? Because they received God's word eagerly and they examined scripture daily. In Thessalonica, Paul had to persuade them, right? They had dialogue back and forth. Do we ever hear about the Bereans again? We don't. But it doesn't mean that they didn't do great things. But my point is this. We hear a lot about the Thessal Thessalonian church. And it encourages me because maybe right now you feel like, yeah, I don't really have a desire to study the Bible. I, I don't really have that desire. Well, praise God. Because when you give your life to Christ, he gives you the desire. We're on equal footing. The, Thess the, the, the Thessalonians were different from the Bereans. But when they became believers and followers of Jesus, wow, look at what happened to their church. Look what happened to them. I'm going to read to you what happened to them. It, it, we're all on equal fo footing because Jesus Christ, his spirit enters your life. And it is him that will give you the ability, the desire to study his word and the ability to follow him and the ability to teach the Bible. Look at what happened to the church in Thessalonica. You also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Verse 7, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. They became an example, a model. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you. God's word was spoken forth from where they were. Not only, can you read this with me? Not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith towards God has gone forth so that we have no need to say anything. You see the principle of multiplication? When Paul explained to them who Jesus was and they were convinced, they were persuaded. God's spirit started to work in their life and they became noble-minded too. They became used by God. Not only did they study, not only did they apply, but they taught scripture all over the place. Look, for they themselves report about us what kind of reception we had with you and how you turned to God. So these people didn't believe in God. They had many idols, just like our lives today. There's many idols in our lives. But when they understood that Jesus is who he says he is, the Messiah, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, they turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God. Not only that, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. We are living in the season of history that we are waiting for Jesus to come back and again. again. In that meantime, in that season, do you want your life to count? I do. And I'm seeing to make our life count, we need to study, apply, and teach Scripture. Look at what happened to the church in Thessalonica. Very different from Berea at the beginning, but look at how they turned out. It's because it's the Spirit of God. And I'm going to end with a story. Last month, we went up to Nueva Ecija about an eight, seven to eight hour drive to the Sierra Madre Mountains to visit the work of Jenny and my classmate. So we had a classmate whose father, when we were in high school, was working with this group of people. And I was visiting what they were doing and I, I got to talk to one of the um, barangay captains who was now a Christian. And I said, I asked him, how has Jesus Christ made a difference in your tribe? And he said, oh, let me tell you a story. So they started telling me. He said, in the late 1940s, this group of people were known as headhunters. This is, is in our country. Headhunters. That meant for them to be able to prove that they were men, they had to bring home a head. They couldn't get married until they brought somebody's head home. They couldn't take a leadership position in their clan if they didn't bring home a head. 
That's how you proved you were a man, that you could kill somebody. And they had different clans in this tribe. And the, and the clan was such that, let's say you and I, you're from one clan, I'm from another clan, and we walked down and we, our paths crossed each other, it would be last man standing. We would fight, and whoever won would bring home the head, and he was the man. That's the culture they had. This is the 1940s. And so, as it became harder and harder to hunt each other, and they were very good in the forest, they went to the lowlands, and they started getting innocent bystanders' heads because that's how they proved that they were men. So the government started taking notice of this group of people, and they said, this is, this is terrible. So they tried. They sent in a religious group to do some work there, but no effect. They rejected the religious group. They sent in an anthropologist, and the anthropologist lasted the longest. He lived with them for some time, but eventually he was killed. They, they sent in some military, a group, of, a, a group of military men. They were killed also. See, this group of people, they were so good in the forest, and they relied on spirits. They had many idols, many gods. They had anting anting. And they had, they had power. They had witch doctors, and they had legit power. So the Philippine government was like, this is crazy. Let's send in our tanks and, you know, full out war and just destroy this group of people. But in that conversation, there was a Christian, as the government was talking about that. And the Christian said, wait, I know of this group. They're called New Tribes Mission. And this is what they do. They go into tribal communities, and they're, they're effective. They, they carry a special message with them. Why don't we give them a chance? So the government said, yeah, nothing to lose. We'll give them a chance. So I want you to imagine now. So they talked to New Tribes Mission. We are New Tribes Mission, all of us, right? And the leader says, friends, we have a great opportunity. We have been asked by the Philippine government to go into the Bukula tribe. Now, you have to know one thing. They are headhunters. How many of you want to go? You know, I praise God. There were two people that volunteered. Marvin Graves and Florentino Santos, a Filipino. They were both single. And they went. And this was, this was their modus operandi. They camped outside of the Bukalot territory, but they would hike in to one clan, leave some gifts, to develop a relationship and then hike back out. And then another day, go to another clan and do the same thing, and then another and go, go back. And on one of their hikes back, it was evening already, it was dark, they couldn't find their tent. So the two missionaries were, in a way, grumbling towards God. God, we're doing this for you. We're risking our lives, and you can't even give us a, a dry place to sleep. They couldn't find their tent, so they ended up sleeping under a tree. Now, it was soon after that that one of the tribal leaders invited both of them into their home. And from there, they were able to foster a relationship, eventually learning part of the language, eventually able to share to them who Jesus is from the Scripture, explaining to them who Jesus is. Now, a year had passed, and the tribal leader asked them, do you remember that night that you did not go back to your tent? How did you know? How did you know what? How did you know that that night we had surrounded your tent and we were ready to kill you that night? And the missionaries were shocked. They had no idea. You know, it just shows me that, you know, sometimes things happen in our lives and we're like, oh God, why are you allowing this? But we don't know what God is doing. God was protecting the missionaries from them. And in fact, God used that because they were the kings of the forest. And nobody knew the forest better than them. The military couldn't beat them. But when these two foreigners, strangers, had outsmarted them in their own backyard, the tribal chief said, there must be something different about these guys. They seem to have a greater power than we do. And that's what led him to invite them into their house because he wanted to know 
What is this power that they have? Long story short, he became a Christian. Christianity started to spread. And I'm going to show you a plaque. This is a plaque. If you go up there to this mountain tribe, you will see this plaque. This is 1954 of June. And what were they celebrating? The gospel message had gone out. And for the first time in June of 1954, you had different clans coming together for the first time with weapons. But as they came together, they laid down their weapons and they worshiped God together. Amazing. That is the power of Christ. And they, they were able to experience who God is because people taught them. And they on their own have studied scripture. They've applied it. And you will be blessed by this. I attended their Sunday service. And it was a missionary from their tribe, a bukalot, who was speaking. And what moved me was they had a tight box right in front of the church. And there were three, three, um, three categories. There was tight offering and missions. And people gave. They gave. They didn't have much, but they gave. And what moved me was this group of people used to be headhunters, but God had infiltrated their life so much, had changed their culture so much because of the power of Christ that now they're a mission-sending organization. Unbelievable. And God wants to do the same in your life and in my life. He was doing it during the book of Acts to the Apostle Paul. He did it in the 1954s and continues to do it, and he's doing it now. But will you and I rise up to the challenge? What's the message? Study, apply, and teach the Bible. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your word, that your word truly transforms lives. And we acknowledge that it is your power that enables us to even have a desire to study your word and to have the power to obey your word and to have the ability to teach your word. And so I pray that for all my brothers and sisters in Christ right now, that, Lord, you would move in our hearts. I know there's a lot of distraction that prevents us from studying your word. Lord, help us to lay aside those counterfeit pleasure, counterfeit joy, counterfeit idols, that we would truly experience the life that you created us for, a life of abundance in, your, in, in a relationship with you, Lord, in power to bear fruit of reaching people for your kingdom and for your namesake. And Lord, I know there's some people in this room who, like the people in Thessalonica, have maybe been reasoning in their minds about you, going back and forth. And maybe today, Lord, through the story of Gerald and his daughter, how you have restored a broken relationship like that. Maybe through the story of, of Paul or the Thessalonians or even the Bukula tribe. Lord, I believe you're convicting them. You're persuading them to believe in you because you really are the one true God. And if you're that person and you're being convicted to lay aside all the counterfeit idols in your life, and you're willing to repent and turn to Jesus, then I would like to pray with you right now. And you pray in your heart with me. Lord, I admit that I have sinned against you. I have destroyed the relationship that you created me for, and that's a relationship with you. But I thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross to pay completely the payment and the penalty of my sin. And this afternoon, I open the door of my heart and I am convinced that you are God. You are Messiah. And I ask you, Jesus, to come into my life, not just to be my Savior, but to be my Lord and Master. Thank you, Jesus, for coming into my life. Thank you for your forgiveness of all my sins and your, for your free gift of eternal life. Please make me into the kind of person you want me to be. And for the rest of us, Jesus, thank you that we serve a living God. And may you use us. And, Lord, we pray again for all the campus missionaries, 
all the young people in this church, Lord, may you ignite a fire in their heart that will burn so brightly for you that our country, our communities will be turned right side up to the power of the gospel. And Lord, use us. Some of, you, some of us, Lord, you bless with good jobs, with businesses. And use us, Lord, to, to be able to play the part that you ha have for us also in being able to help support and reach this country for you. So thank you for this privilege. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.